بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I'm Dr. Ahmed Abdelhadi, an IC consultant and an IC program director. Uh, today I will start to talking about weaning from mechanical ventilation in COVID pandemic. So we'll start by talking about the weaning as a process and then we'll go for what is the difference between COVID patient and non-COVID patient in weaning issue. So today we'll talk about the definition of weaning, classification of weaning, process of weaning, weaning method, extubation, and then we'll talk briefly what is new regarding COVID pandemic in weaning. So regarding definition of weaning, it is the transition process from total ventilatory support to spontaneous breathing. This period may take many forms ranging from Abrupt withdrawal, just remove the mechanical ventilation and make the patient to breathe spontaneously, to gradual withdrawal from the ventilatory support, and we'll talk about the method of weaning in detail later on. What about the classification of weaning? We can classify the weaning as a process to simple weaning, which is said to occur when a patient tolerates the first trial of spontaneous breathing, and then he is successfully extubated. And fortunately, it records about 70% of our intubated ICU patients. Difficult weaning, it is failure to tolerate the initial spontaneous breathing trial. But the patient successfully weaned, but requiring up to three other spontaneous breathing trial or another up to seven days from the first failed spontaneous breathing trial. Prolonged weaning, it's when patients fail three or more spontaneous breathing trial, or it take more than seven days after first failed spontaneous breathing trial to wean him successfully from mechanical ventilation. Lastly, there is the ventilator dependent patient we, who we, we are failing to extubate him and he will be on the mechanical ventilation for the rest of his life. So regarding the discontinuing mechanical ventilation, I consider this process to be a three-step process. It is not a one-step process at all. First step is the readiness for weaning. This means that in which objective clinical criteria or some physiological test known as weaning predictor are evaluated to determine whether a patient is ready to begin weaning. Second step is the weaning trial, which is a process of decreasing ventilatory support and allowing the patient to assume a greater proportion of their ventilation. It may involve either an immediate shift from full ventilatory support to a period of breathing without assistance from the ventilator, and we call that spontaneous breathing trial, or a gradual reduction in the amount of ventilator support. Third step is extubation. It's considered once the patient demonstrates the ability to breathe without the ventilator and the airway is patent, airway protection have been assessed, then at that time we can remove safely the intracal tube and this is what we call the extubation. We'll start talking about the first step which is readiness for weaning. What is the clinical criteria? Clinical criteria, some objective data, which is easily to be collected a bit side from the patient, that give us a hint that this patient is ready to wean from mechanical ventilation. This clinical criteria, including some required criteria and some additional criteria. The required criteria, including that, number one, the cause of respiratory failure has improved. The code that put the patient in mechanical ventilation has subsided or treated. Number two, the hypoxic index is more than 150, or the patient saturation is more than 90% on FiO2 less than or equal to 40% with B less than or equal to 5. His EBG showing a pH is more than 7.25. 
hemodynamic stability so that the patient has no or low doses of vasopressor medication. Lastly, the patient is able to initiate an inspiratory effort by himself. What about the additional criteria? The additional criteria included hemoglobin more than seven. We all know that how much the importance of hemoglobin in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. The patient's core temperature is less than or equal to 38 to 38.5 because any fever, it increases the oxygen consumption and it is more load on the respiratory system for the patient. Mental status, the patient has to be awake, alert, or at least easily arousable. What these other the weaning predictors? There is some another physiological test that can be gathered from simple equipment or just from mechanical ventilation or actually from sophisticated equipment. This physiological parameter is called the weaning predictor. A lot of weaning predictors are there. Some are related to the oxygenation like hypoxic index or alveolar arterial oxygen gradient or dead space. Some related to the lung mechanics like negative inspiratory force or the dynamic or static compliance of the respiratory system, vital capacity. Some are integrated between both of them, like the one which is the very famous winning predictor, and we will talk about it later because it's very important, which measure both in the same time, the frequency and the tidal volume, and it's called the rapid shallow breathing index. Another indice is like group index, core index, integrated winning index. Another complex measurement like airway occlusion pressure measured at 100 millisecond, esophageal pressure, oxygen cost of breathing, mechanical work of breathing. So a lot of winning predictors are being examined and studied to assess its ability to predict successful winning from the ventilator. The only one that get popular and used in many studies and easily to be applied is the rapid shallow breathing index. So what is the rapid shallow breathing index? The rapid shallow breathing index is one of the best studied and most commonly used weaning predictors. Rapid shallow breathing index is the ratio of respiratory frequency to tidal volume in liter. As an example, a patient who has a respiratory rate of 25 breath per minute, Tidal volume of 250 ml per breath. His rapid shallow breathing index is 25 over 0.25 liter, so it's equal to 100 breath per minute per liter. Patients who cannot tolerate independent breathing tend to breathe rapidly and shallow. So he will have very high rapid shallow breathing index. While patients who can tolerate independent breathing tend to breathe more slowly, which means low frequency and also deeply, which means higher tidal volume. Thus, they generally have a low rapid shallow breathing index. The magic number we should remember is 105. So if the patient rapid shallow breathing index less than 105, most probably he will be successfully weaned. If more than 105, most probably he will not successfully weaned. So how can I calculate the tidal volume and the frequency while the patient is attached to mechanical ventilation. To do that, we have several methods. We suggest that the respiratory frequency and tidal volume to be measured using a handheld spirometer attached to the intracal tube while a patient is breathing room air for one minute without any ventilatory assistance, which means that we just remove the tubes of mechanical ventilation, attach the spirometer, and keep, let the patient to breathe for one minute, and the spirometer will count for us the tidal volume, and then we'll count for him the frequency, and then we'll calculate the rapid shallow breathing index. But this is not the only method we can use. We can also calculate it while the patient is attached to mechanical ventilation, but the patient has to be spontaneously breathing, and also, the patient has to be in minimal ventilatory support, which either using only CBAB of five centimeter water or just a pressure support between five to eight 
centimeter water. If the rapid shallow breathing index is measured on ventilatory support, for sure, the value will be lower than if measured during independent breathing at all. Some experts recommend to reduce this confounding influence to set the ventilator to pressure support of zero and beep of zero and no flow trigger. And then we see how much tidal volume the patient can take and how much his frequency and then calculating the rabbit shallow breathing index for him. But actually, still the resistance of the ventilator tube system and the intercal tube will be opastical against the patient to breathe well. This is the first step. So we have to use the clinical criteria that we tell before regarding the patient ability to wean. And we can add to it one of the weaning predictor, which is the rapid shallow breathing index. If the patient passed this readiness to weaning, which is the first step, we'll go for the second step now, which is trial of weaning. We said before, weaning is the process of decreasing the amount of support that the patient receives from mechanical ventilation. So the patient assume a greater proportion of ventilatory effort. Purpose is to assess the probability that mechanical ventilation can be successfully discontinued. What is the traditional method of weaning? The traditional method of weaning trial includes spontaneous breathing trial, which is the most famous and the most important one, or progressive decrease in the level of pressure support. So we shift the patient, but whatever mood he is on, to a pressure support mood with a high setting, then progressively we decrease the pressure support. The third one is put the patient in mandatory mode like intermittent mandatory ventilation or synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. And gradually we get down the set rate by the ventilator and then decreasing the number of ventilator assisted breath. So the patient will spontaneously breathe more and more and see how he's doing. What the guidelines said, the guidelines suggest weaning via once daily spontaneous breathing trial rather than progressive pressure support ventilation or intermittent mandatory ventilation. What is the spontaneous breathing trial? It refers to a patient breathing through the intracal tube either without any support, which means that disconnect the patient with the ventilator, put him in TPs, and I will show you the picture of TPs after a while. Or we can do the same test while the patient has a minimal ventilatory support just to overcome the resistance of the intracal tube. What is the minimal ventilatory support we can use? We can use low level of fixed pressure support between five to eight. Or some ventilator has the automatic tube compensation, which is a variable pressure support, a variable pressure support based on calculation of known resistive coefficient of the artificial airway, depend on the size and length which you have to be entered to the ventilator as an entry data to calculate the automatic tube compensation. Then the ventilator will use this data, combining with the measurement of the flow and the pressure during the entire respiratory cycle. And then the ventilator will get a pressure support to overcome all of this resistance by variable pressure based on the variable resistance faced by the patient. This is called automatic tube compensation. Third way to do the spontaneous breathing trial in minimal ventilatory support is by using a continuous positive air pressure or CPAP of just five centimeter water. What guidelines said? Guidelines suggest that spontaneous breathing trial may be performed with low level of inspiratory pressure support from five to eight, even better than to do a T-piece. What is the T-piece? At this in this picture, picture, the patient is disconnected from the tubes of the ventilator, attach it to this T-piece, it's like letter T, and it has a reservoir tube from one side, and the other side is the source of oxygen with the venturi, and we put the patient FiO2 required based on it, oxygen saturation.
However, appropriate method may be considered on individualized basis. I will give you an example. For patient with a very small, high resistant intracal tube, we suggest instead to put the patient on TPS trial, no, we suggest using low level of pressure support or automatic tube compensation rather than TPS trial or CPAP. While the patient with borderline cardiac function and we suspect that heart failure will be the main cause of respiratory failure and reattach the patient to mechanical ventilation later on. So the best way in this situation is to use the TPS trial. Why of that? Because if you put the patient in TPS, no any, any ventilatory support by any pressure that can support the cardiac function. So if the patient passed the trial with TPS, this means that he is ready to be extubated later on. How much we put the patient on this trial? For how long, I mean? An initial spontaneous breathing trial of 30 minute duration is generally sufficient to determine whether mechanical ventilation can be discontinued. For patients who fail their initial spontaneous breathing trial, what shall I do? I have to put the patient back to the mechanical ventilation for support, and then I can assess him again daily by spontaneous breathing trial but I have to figure out why the patients failed the trial and to manage it. In the next trials, better to give him more time during the trial, up to 120 minutes, before you decide that the patient is ready to extubation. There is some what we call the weaning protocol. It is either manual protocolized weaning, which is weaning protocol promote the application of evidence-based weaning strategies most of which incorporated a manual daily screen. It is done daily as a screening for every patient attached to mechanical ventilation. This is why to identify patients, those are ready to be weaned from mechanical ventilation followed by a weaning trial. Another form of weaning protocol, but at that time, it is automated weaning. It is computerized, closed loop weaning software package, which are available, in some of the ventilators under the name of smart care that automate weaning by pressure support. Here the pressure support, the automated weaning program adjust the level of pressure support to keep the patient in normal range of what? Of intermittently monitored respiratory rate, tidal volume and exhaled carbon dioxide. So either it decrease or increase the pressure support to keep the patient in a comfortable zone in the numbers of his respiratory rate, his tidal volume, and also his intidal CO2. Once a patient is stable at specific level of pressure support, the program automatically reduces the pressure support level until it reaches the degree that the patient is able to be extubated. The ventilator will tell you the patient is ready for extubation. But take care, this mode is not suitable for patients with a high baseline PaCO2 like acute and chronic respiratory failure. This is the example of manual verticalized weaning. It is, and this is the example of automated weaning protocol smart care. What the guidelines suggest regarding this weaning protocol? They suggest that for patients who are not in highly starved, close the ICU unit. So we recommend using a weaning protocol. This is will facilitate the liberation of the patient from the ventilator more faster with less ICU stay and hospital stay and less complication. But for patients who are in highly staffed close the ICU, like in academic hospital, the guideline just suggest using a weaning protocol because these patients are seen daily by treating physician who are capable of determining if the patient is ready to be weaned or not. Identifying weaning success regardless of weaning strategy used. Away from, regardless of the weaning strategy used, the clinician must determine whether the weaning was a success or failure. How can we determine if the patient is successfully passed the weaning trial or not? This is depend on some objective criteria that may indicate weaning failure, which include tachypnea, respiratory distress by using the accessory muscle, thoracoabdominal paradox, diaphoresis, any hemodynamic change like tachycardia, hypertension, hypoxia, 
and even any change in mental state like somnolence or agitation. This is why if you give the patient a trial of weaning, you have to be beside the patient watching him during this trial to watch of any of this indicator of failure of weaning. Example of criteria used to identify failure, failed weaning attempt in clinical trial include development of heart rate more than 140 beat per minute or a sustained increase of greater than 20% from baseline before we start weaning. Respiratory rate greater than 35 breath per minute. Systolic blood pressure greater than 180 or less than 90. Pulse oxygen saturation less than 90%. BAO2 in the ABG less than 50 millimeter mercury. pH in the ABG less than 7.32. Marked diaphoresis or agitation. All of this indicate that the weaning trial have been failed. However, Clinicians should always use their clinical judgment at the bedside and not rely solely on these parameters. Clinical impression determine whether a patient fail or tolerate weaning. Patients who tolerate the spontaneous breathing trial should be considered for the third step, which is the extubation. When a patient fail weaning, the reason for failure should be sought and corrected. Common cause including Underlying source of respiratory failure not being fully corrected still. He is intubated because of pneumonia and he is not fully recovered from pneumonia yet. There is imbalance between the work of breathing and the respiratory muscle capacity. Volume overload, one of the major rules of failure of weaning, especially with liberal fluid resuscitation, cardiac dysfunction, neuromuscular weakness, delirium, and anxiety metabolic disturbance, electrolyte disturbance, adrenal insufficiency, meaning while the patient should be assessed daily for redness of weaning. What the guidelines said about that? Guidelines suggest weaning such patient via once daily spontaneous breathing trial after we search and correct the cause of failure rather than using a multiple trials per day or to decrease, to put him in pressure support to the high level, decreasing the level two to four centimeter water daily or to put him in intermittent mandatory ventilation and decreasing the mandatory rate uh, slowly over the days. No, the best is to try for him once daily spontaneous breathing trial after you correct the cause of failure. Then we'll know if the patient passed everything. We are ready now to remove the tube, which is called the extubation. This is the third step. Extubation refer to removal of the intracal tube. It is the final step in liberating a patient from mechanical ventilation. Extubation should not be ordered until it has been determined that patient medical condition is stable, weaning trial has been successful, airway is patent, and any potential difficulty in re-intubation has been identified, and then we can go for this final step. Most patients are extubated during daytime hour. Why of that? Because the staff will be there around the patient and the patient will be in his awaking hours. So the staff can observe the patient in good way and the patient had the power to tolerate the weaning process. Although nocturnal extubation is appropriate in selected circumstances. For most patients whose medical condition is improving, who pass the, their spontaneous breathing trial with normal cough strength, how can we determine that the patient has a good cough? Either we can use an, an specified spirometry, which is attached to the expiratory limb of the ventilator, and see how much the cough peak expiratory flow. If it's more than 60 liters per minute, so the patients can pass and the patient has a good cough or simply by doing what we call the index car test. So the intracal tube is detached from the ventilator circuit and the cart is held approximately one to two centimeters from the proximal end of the intracal tube. The patient is instructed to cough. A patient who is unable to moist the cart with three to four cough trial in three times, more likely to fail extubation than the patient who can moist the cart. For sure, the patient has to have a glass coma score more than or equal to eight before 
extubating him. If the patient has a glaucoma scale below eight, usually he cannot protect the airway. We didn't mention anything about the gag reflex. We can extubate patient with a negative gag reflex. There is a lot of patient living with no gag reflex, but cuff is very important. TCS is very important. Also, we have to ask the nurse how much the suctioning needed for this patient. It has to be not more than every three, two to three hours. And the nature of the secretion, it has to be a little bit watery, but this secretion has more tendency to cause obstruction of the airway and the atelectasis post extubation. If all of this there, then we can go for the last step before liberation of the patient, which is cuff leak test. A cuff leak refers to normal airflow around the intracal tube after the cuff of the intracal tube is deflated. Absence of cuff, of leak, sorry, suggests that there is reduced space between the intracal tube and the larynx. This may be due to laryngeal edema or laryngeal injury or some secretion between the tube and the laryngeal wall. Stenosis, a large intracal tube relatively to the size of the larynx. Patient without a cuff leak are at higher risk of post extubation strider, which may lead to reintubation of the patient. Cuff leak can be detected qualitatively and quantitatively. Qualitatively is performed just deflating the cuff and then listening for air movement by stethoscope placed over the upper trachea. Air movement heard by stethoscope indicate that there is leak around the tube after we deflate the cuff. So this means that there is no laryngeal obstruction. We can do that, but in quantitative way, by deflating the intracal tube cuff and measuring the difference between the inspired and expired tidal volume of the ventilator de delivered the breath during volume cycle mechanical ventilation. If cuff leak volume greater than or equal to 110 milli or greater than 24% of the delivered tidal volume, then we consider a normal cuff leak test. For most patients, cuff leak does not need to be performed unless risk factors for post extubation stridor from laryngeal edema are present. What is this risk factor? When we suspect that the stridor can be there post extubation, Number one, if the prolongation, if, if the intubation time is so prolonged, which means that more than six days, age re, re, greater than 80 years, large intracal tube size, more than eight in men, more than seven in women, an elevated acute physiology and chronic health evaluation score, a batch to score, traumatic intubation, history of asthma, excessive tube mobility due to insufficient fixation, all of this indicate that this patient has very high risk for both extubation strider and it's better to do for him cuff leak test before extubation. If the patient has negative cuff leak test, which means we deflate the cuff and no air leaked around the intracal tube at all. So we have to treat him with something to decrease the laryngeal edema. What of this is the corticosteroid. The typical regimen include methylprednisolone 20 mg IV every four hours for total four do doses prior to extubation, or to give him at least single dose, but of 40 mg four hour prior to extubation. What the guidelines said about the cuff leak test. For patient with risk factor for post extubation strider who have a reduced or absent cuff leak, we suggest administrating a short course of glucocorticoid therapy at least four hours prior to extubation rather than no glucocorticoid therapy. Now, cuff leak is busted and the patient is ready to extubate it. So what the equipment has to be ready before we start extubation? The equipment needed for extubation include oral and intracal tube suction, catheter and tubing, tap cutter, 10 cc syringe MT1, as well as several types of oxygen delivery system, including low flow and high flow nasal cannula, high flow, simple face mask, and access to non invasive equipment, and also access to re intubation if the extubation failed.
patient should be closely monitored following extubation in the intensive care unit. For most patients who are at low risk of intubation, we suggest to put him in low flow oxygen like nasal cannula or venturi face mask rather than high flow oxygen like high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive. Most of the patients are lying in this category and can be discharged from the ICU after 12 to 24 hours provided no other indication for ICU care are present. For patients at high risk of reintubation, so aggressive monitoring and management will continue with continued medical therapies. Oxygenation and the airway clearance measure should be performed to prevent reintubation for at least 48 hours before we consider the weaning is successful. Sometimes we may need to add for the patient oropharyngeal airway or nasopharyngeal airway for suctioning. We need to make the patients awake most of the time. Very good chest physiotherapy. Sometimes we may use incensive pyrometry to open the lung and to prevent antalexis. So the high risk patient has to stay in the ICU post extubation for at least 48 hours. We do not routinely extubate the patient and put him in another assisted devices like high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation. But we extubate directly some patient to non-invasive post-pressure ventilation by fitted face mask for roughly six to 24 hours, not at the risk cue for respiratory failure, no. Just we remove the tube, put the patient in non-invasive post-pressure ventilation in some selected group of patients. For example, patient with severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and patient with cardiac failure, whose our assessment shows greater risk of weaning failure. So if your assessment show that, so and the patient succeed the spontaneous breathing trial and the cuff leak test, and you want to extubate him, just prepare non-invasive post-pressure ventilation, attach the patient immediately following removal of the tube to non-invasive post-pressure ventilation for at least six to 24 hours that will help to prevent or to decrease the reintubation uh, uh, incidence for this patient. What about resume the feeding of the patient? Following extubation, clinician should assess the safety of refeeding. Timing of refeeding is individualized and depend upon factors, including duration of intubation, mental status of the patient, underlying comorbidity, like neuromuscular disease, critical illness myopathy, poor level of consciousness. Typically, most patients intubated for short period, less than six to seven days, can generally eat within a few hours after extubation under direct supervision. While those who have been intubated for more prolonged period or with comorbidities that increase the risk of aspiration, they may need formal assessment within 24 to 48 hours before start feeding. Now I will come to talk about most important part of my lecture about what is different in COVID-19 patient regarding the weaning issue. COVID-19 is a novel coronavirus, which was identified in late 2019 as a cause of cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. It has since rapidly spread resulting in pandemic. Virus that cause COVID-19 is designated severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. The major morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 is largely due to acute viral pneumonitis, also myocarditis, also hypercoagulable state and pulmonary embolism, that all lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome, which require invasive ventilatory support. Accurate data on duration of mechanical ventilation are limited, but we observe in our unit that COVID-19 patient has more than 10 days on mechanical ventilation before to start to improve. And when they improve, the weaning is go successfully than any other comorbidity that cause prolonging mechanical ventilation. And we'll mention this later. Patients are often ready for extubation while they remain infectious. This is a big problem. Yeah, and the patient is ready for extubation, but still he's shedding the virus. And because extubation is frequently associated with some coughing, it's considered an erosal generating procedure. Similar to intubation, we encourage and we insist 
that the use of extubation protocol and use of full personal protective equipment in negative pressure room. It's very important. We will talk about the redness for extubation. Redness of extubation for COVID patient attached to mechanical ventilation should follow the standard practice of performance, sponta performing spontaneous breathing trial. But here, we prefer to do the spontaneous breathing trial not in TPs, but in closed loop system attached to mechanical ventilation using either a low pressure support or low CPAP level or automatic tube compensation. Also, to reduce the risk of free intubation, which make a very hazardous issue for the intubating team, we prefer a higher degree of redness, which means that if you want to use a pressure support goes lower level, like five or below, if you will go for spontaneous breathing trial, go for a longer period, like two hours or even more, before we said that the patient is ready to be extubated. So this practice varies and may include higher criteria for passing a spontaneous breathing trial. For example, some experts use lower pressure support ventilation parameter 0 to 5 rather than typical 7 to 8. Also, for longer period, 2 to 4 hour rather than the typical 2 hour. The rationale for altered criteria is based upon the observation that patients with COVID-19 are intubated for longer period than non-COVID patients and presence of evidence that suggests high volume of secretion and airway edema in COVID patients. All of these factors lead the patient at high risk of post-extubation failure requiring re-intubation. In addition, we prefer extubating the patient directly to low flow oxygen like nasal cannula or face mask or Venturi mask rather than high flow oxygen like a high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation which carrying a risk of aerosolization of the virus. Now we have to think about the ultrasound because ultrasound has played a very important role to assess the readiness of weaning from mechanical ventilation. We know that the diaphragm is the principal respiratory muscle. In recent years, diaphragmatic ultrasonography has emerged as a safe, non-radiation, bedside tool for assessment of diaphragm function and prediction of weaning outcome. It provides both morphological and functional information in real time. Furthermore, it allows repeated measurement over time. Several ultrasound techniques, such as B mode and M mode, have been used to assess the diaphragmatic sonographic predictor, which is the diaphrag excursion, which measures the distance that the diaphragm is able to move during respiratory cycle and spontaneous breathing, and also the diaphragm thickness fraction which is the ratio between difference in thickness from inspiration and expiration divided by the thickness of expiration, both done while the patient spontaneously breath in minimal support. This is how can you put the probe to assess the, the, the diaphragm. Here we can see the excursion of diaphragm during inspiration, during expiration also how much a difference of thickness in the diaphragm between the inspiration and expiration. Also, the diaphragm will help us a lot to visualize cardiac function. We know that the COVID-19 virus can cause myocarditis. So we can assess the cardiac function before we extubate or wean the patient. Also assess his volume status by assessing the size and distanceability of the inferior vena cava. Also we can assess the amount of water in the lung by assessing the B lines in the lung field. All of what can be done bedside very easy and can predict the successful weaning. Shall we go for cuff leak test here? This is another big issue because if we did a cuff leak test, there is risk for spread of the virus. So whether the cuff leak test should be performed routinely prior to extubation, it is unclear in COVID patient. However, you have to know that its performance may be guided by clinical suspicions of some airway edema and presence of risk factor for post extubation stridor and it should be weighted against the potential risk of spreading of the virus. So it has to be in a negative pressure isolation room, and it has to be, and the person who is doing it has to be protected fully against the spread of the virus. 
Some experts who notice high rate of airway edema post extubation of COVID patients routinely administer glucorticoid, which is methabrinazolone, 20 milligram IV every four hours for total four doses. To most patients with COVID-19 before extubation, regardless of cuff leak test. But no recommendation of this practice. Now the patient is ready to be extubated. What we have to do to protect ourselves from the disease? We prefer to perform extubation in airborne isolation room. Respiratory therapist and the others in the room during extubation should adhere to airborne precaution, including N95 mask and eye protection or equivalent. In general, only two people are needed inside the room and extra staff to be outside the room ready to help us with any additional equipment. Some experts using some medication to decreasing the cuff during extubation, like lidocaine via intracal tube, a low dose opioid polis, although data to support the routine use of antacid are limited in COVID patients. What we'll do now? Both low flow and high flow oxygen system should be set up and ready available. We drape the patient chest and face with a plastic cover before we remove the tube. Or we can use the intubation box. Why of that? To provide a barrier protection between the patient and the operator. We typically put the patient before we get the tube out in a standby mode or even switch it off immediately prior to extubation to prevent any air to leak from the ventilator to the room. After balloon deflation, extra care should be taken during extubation to keep the inline section catheter engaged during cuff deflation and to have another handheld suction catheter available for the removal of the pharyngeal or oral secretion. Then, intercal tube, after we deflate the cuff, remove this as smoothly as we can during inspiration and dispose of into a biohazard plastic bag with the ventilator tubing, plastic drape, tape, intercal tube holder, and inline suction catheter, and then this bag sealed and disposed immediately. This is the example of intubation box, and how can we cover the face of the patient prior to remove the tube? The patient is monitored following the procedure. The threshold to re-intubate this patient has to be very low. Post-extubation care should support the application of supplemental oxygen, as we mentioned before, at low fraction of inspired oxygen. Nasal cannula, face mask, venturi mask, it's better than applying high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive post pressure ventilation, which can erode the virus, spread the virus more. What about the tracheostomy for this patient? Reports from experts in the field suggest that many patients fail early attempt at weaning within the first week, although this does not appear to predict their eventual ability to wean and extubate. However, some patients require tracheostomy in most reports less than 10% from the patient admitted to the ICU. When I have to think about tracheostomy, not early, as I mentioned before, COVID pneumonia patients who require invasive mechanical ventilation, they tend to have a prolonged course of mechanical ventilation between 10 to 14 days, and most of them can be extubated safely. So indication appear too similar to non-COVID patients, which mean failed extubation trials, secretion management, airway edema, neurological impairment, The optimal timing for tracheostomy is unknown in COVID patients. In non-COVID, changes in practice have led to most intensivists performing tracheostomy around day seven to 10 following initial intubation. But it seems reasonable to defer tracheostomy in patients with COVID-19 beyond this time frame. COVID-19 patients appear to require mechanical ventilation longer than other, two to three weeks, but can still be successfully extubated after this point. How can I do this procedure? Same principle, tracheostomy is considered, again, high-risk procedure for aerosolization. So both open and percutaneous tracheostomy procedure are accepted in COVID patients. Exact procedure should be determined in advance before we start with the minimum number of personnel. While the patient attached to the ventilator and you want, we, we decide to go for tracheostomy for him, we have to give the patient the neuromuscular blockade. Why? To prevent the, any cuff from the patient. 
it is preferable that the procedure be done at the bedside in airborne isolation room. The operator should wear appropriate PPE similar to other aerosol generating procedure. The tracheostomy tube should have the syringe attached. So once we put the tracheostomy tube, we just immediately inflate the balloon. In addition, adopted with inline suction catheter attached is also appropriate. This is how can we put some draped plastic sheet that cover the whole patient face and neck while we are doing the procedure of tracheostomy to protect the operator from the virus. Tracheostomy mask trial. So I, am, I have that a tracheostomy for a COVID patient attached to mechanical ventilation. Can I go for trach mask trial? Yes, it can be done safely, but it has to be done in airborne isolation room also. With the, resumption, with the resumption of the ventilation and a closed loop system following the trial if it failed. Surgical mask over the tracheostomy itself may be a theoretically limited droplet spread, but still the droplet can be spread between, between the mask and the patient to the air in the room. Once a patient can breathe for 24 hour and tracheal mask, they can undergo trial of a speaking valve and capping with a balloon deflation. At that time, when we're applying a speaking valve and cap, and we deflate the balloon, here the risk of spreading of the virus is limited to the upper airway of the patient. So theoretically, if we apply a mask for the patient, it will protect the, uh, anybody deal with the patient from getting infection. Decannulation is considered an erosal generating procedure also, and provided the patient remain infectious, all the usual air precaution should be taken. From all of how, what I mentioned, we can take these messages. Although weaning over the years has become more objective and evidence-based, there are still questions relating to predictive models of weaning newer weaning modes. Daily assessment by spontaneous breathing trial should be done if not contraindicated. Weaning indices like rabbit shallow breathing index, special number is 105 is a good indicator. Assess for discontinuation and for extubation Consider optimized cause of difficult weaning like heart failure or volume overload. Weaning, still science plus art. COVID patient weaned as non-COVID patient with some precaution of protection of airborne disease. And patient should be ultra ready to extubate. Ultra ready, not only ready. And have low threshold. We have to have low threshold of re-intubation if extubation failed. This is my sources. Thank you very much.